evening, and welcome to the old colonial courthouse. I am Elena Lawton, and I'm a member of the board and also a part of the program committee here for Tales of Cape Cod. Tonight's speaker is Skip Finley, who is the author of Whaling Captains of Color. And our sponsors are Greg and Barbara Masterson, Lucy Loomis and Dan Santos, and myself and my husband, Art Lawton. So let's give a round of applause. Now, uh, next week's uh, program is uh, the popular Cape Cod historian Don Welding uh, presents Cape Cod Shipwrecks, Stories of Tragedy and Triumph. And that will be sponsored by Avery Rivere and Friends of the Barnstable Harbor. So, tonight, following the program, the books will be sold and we will have a wonderful reception prepared by our famous Jude Martin. So uh, take time for that after the program. Now, about our speaker. Skip Henley, Finley is a retired broadcaster who built his career in radio, becoming a well-known executive and station owner. His career included responsibility for 44 radio stations, five that he owned, in 18 markets and includes successes with radio networks, syndicated programs, formats, and a satellite channel. Skip has written articles for the Vineyard Gazette, Martha's Vineyard Magazine, Island Weddings Magazine, The Providence Banner, uh, MVM Quarterly, Martha's Vineyard Museum Publications, Sea History Magazine, and Cape Cod and the Islands Magazine. His book, Whaling Captains of Color, America's First Meritocracy, was published by the Naval Institute in June 2020 and has received impressive reviews. His writings are liked because he relies on primary sources whenever possible, and it's not a repeat of what others have written. So at this time, I'd like to introduce you to Skip Finley. Thank you, Thank you very much. As a former hard work and media type, I would <clears throat> I urge you to hold the pause until after I finish, because you never know. <clears throat> I'd like to thank you, Tales of Cape Cod. Um, it's amazing to find this many of you who don't have anything better to do on a Monday evening. When, you know, it's such a wonderful place in a beautiful town. Duncan Oliver was so gracious as to bring me from the ferry up here to speak and gave me a small tour of the place. Um, besides the homes, I think I might like the sand castles I've seen all around better than anything. <clears throat> but these stained glass windows are hard to beat. Um, this evening, what I'm going to try to do um, is talk a little bit about my book, because I want you—you know—I know everybody wants to know, you know, well, how these guys get to be captains and how'd you find them? We're going to touch on that. Um, the story starts kind of early when, failing retirement for the fifth time, I decided I wanted to be a writer. Thanks to the publisher of the Vineyard Gazette, who I met, um, I was allowed to write the Oak Bluff Town column for about five years. And while that was going on, quite an amazing thing happened. The Mystic Seaport Museum launched the restored Charles W. Morgan and decided they're going to put it back afloat and take it around to some historic places. Of course, you know, here off Stellwagen Bank, New Bedford, of course. But Martha's Vineyard, where I've lived since 1955 during the summers, and year-round since around, two, around 1999. Um, it was very important, that ship, to the island of Martha's Vineyard, important enough so that Martha's Vineyard Magazine decided to devote an entire issue in May, June 2014 to its restoration and launch. I was asked if I would write a story about the black whaling captain named William A. Martin you know, from Egertown. All I heard was I got to write an article for a magazine, to be honest, and I went crazy. 
First, though, the importance of that ship to the island of Martha's Vineyard is pretty stellar. Its first captain and 17 of its original 30 crew members were from the island. As time went on, seven of its captains in its whole history captained that ship over the many years of its whaling. One of those guys was, Charles, was William A. Martin, and the question I asked myself was, how in the hell does black guy get to be a whaling ship captain or captain of anything in the late 1800s? It didn't take long for me to discover that he was not only not the first one, but he wasn't the only one. You know, and then I have to interject into my story so people know, I kind of am ADHD and OCD, which, not too good for going to school, but wonderful if you find yourself writing a book. Because I went crazy. Uh, I, I, just to find the answer of how this guy got to be captain, I started buying and reading whaling books. It was maybe a month and a half or two months later, and my wife, who pays all of our bills, I'm entrusted with an ATM card and a very small allowance. <laughs> I do our taxes because I'm not crazy and I cheat. Um, but she came in the office and says, what's going on here? You spent over $1,400 on books in the last two weeks. So I'm like, oh yeah, I'm trying to find out and told her the story. She says, okay, fine, you're busy, you're in your office, we'll just leave you alone. Not too long later, <clears throat> um, those 140 books on whaling became 160, or except for Richard Kings, who was supposed to have been here tonight, and I hope you get to speak with, you know, sometime soon. Um, you know, Richard wrote a fabulous book. It's the only whaling book I don't have yet, but it's on the way via Amazon. Um, he's also a fabulous illustrator. But along with those books, I read a bunch of monographs, masters and doctoral theses. I've interviewed descendants of whaling captains. I've studied museums. I've read up on the experts, Starbuck, Hegarty, and Judith Lund. And of course, I've read the entire interweb. What I found out from my publisher, though, after I sent her my 185,000-word manuscript in the email, well, how many words is this supposed to be? And she said, oh, 70 or 80,000. I'm like, oh, yoy. Turned out it's a lot easier to cut words than to add them. Um, so 80,000 words later, I learned that I could not use Ancestry.com or Wikipedia as a source. So I leaned very heavily on what were called the Siemens Protection Papers, for those of you who haven't heard of it. This was a document authorized by the Fourth Congress in May 1796 to protect American merchant seamen from impressment by the British. You'll recall we were at war with the British a few times in those years, 1766, the Revolutionary War, the 1812. Then there's some times after that in skirmishes. From those papers was, was prepared a thing that we call kind of loosely the crew list at this point. And that defined men of color, which was Negro, mulatto, Indian, black, brown, dark, yellow, or copper colored persons. These were free black men, former slaves, West Indians, American Indians, Cape Verdeans, Kanakas, or Hawaiians, Maori, Portuguese, and South Sea Islanders. They were not African Americans, I like to say that because, you know, slaves were certainly not Africans, and they weren't Americans till the 1965 Voting Rights Act, I like to say. What put that all together was in the last Great Depression, the Workers' Progress Administration was charged with finding ways to pay people for some amount of work. So they would gather artists together, and they would take these Siemens Protection Papers and list them all on index cards. Those index cards are literally at the New Bedford Free Public Library um, at the, at, you know, and at the Whaling Museum. Um, but at that Free Public Library, there are 130 file drawers, each with between 1,500 of these cards. I know that because I went there and read every single one of them. I made copies of many. I had copies made, but at 25 cents a copy, it was a lot cheaper to buy my own scanner, and I did it myself. From that, thanks to the wonderful folks at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, and the Mystic Seaport Museum using Judith Lund's work of collating all this information about whaling. Um, this is now available on a website called whalinghistory.org. And if you think that one of your antecedents you know, was a whaling captain, you can punch their name in and it will tell you. Chances are you're going to find that they were not. <laughs> on Cape Cod, whaling included 14 towns from 1785 until 1920. The largest, of course, was a place called Provincetown, you may have heard of, way up at the top. And thanks to a video a friend of mine shared with me of a man named George Bryant, 
who was literally, in this video, walking through a cemetery in Provincetown saying, that was a whaling captain, that was a whaling captain, that was a black whaling captain, that was a black whaling captain. And seeing that, I, of course, lost my mind. <clears throat> When I say lost my mind, I probably ought to quantify that because a lot of information I'd like to share with you was, you know, rather finite quantifiably. So I think my tab for this book now is pretty close to $40,000. I've made much of that back selling books. Thank you, Tickham. I really appreciate that. Support your local independent bookseller because there are not many and there are not going to be many left. Anyway, all of whaling was conducted in 75 ports. Eight of them, only eight of them, were from southern ports. There were one from Edenton, North Carolina, and there were seven in Wilmington, Delaware. That, when I say those numbers, seven, there were seven ships that left in whaling ships from Wilmington, Delaware. So you might say, well, if there were 75 ports, why were there not more ports in the south? Well, thanks to the Fugitive A Slave Acts of 1793 and 1850, that was when a person who owned slaves or thought they owned slaves or wanted to own slaves could point a black person out and say, that's my slave and I want them back. That included on ships. So when whale ships went into, say, Charleston, South Carolina, the people of color on board may have to stay in jail overnight or may have to stay in jail permanently as the ship leaves because they may have been fugitive slaves. There's too much money involved for that. So whalers said, that's real easy. We'll do our business in North where these men of color can stay aboard our ships where we want them to be whaling and not enslaved. Over the period of time that we're talking about whaling, literally from 1715 until 1928, there have been recorded 15,913 whaling trips by Starbuck and Hegarty and Lund, folks that I mentioned earlier. Each of these was a separate business enterprise, if you can imagine that. Each in every one of those trips. What we know now about whaling is this was the model for today's private equity funds and hedge funds. It operated the same way. People get together, they put some money in the pot, and they invest. They hire management, a captain. They hire a crew. They get a ship, they equip a ship. They send the ship out, you know, for whale. It comes back with products. They take the amount of their investment back off the table, which is about fifty dollars or $60,000, and they share what was left with that on an incentive basis called a lay with the rest of the crew. As it turns out, it took another 100 years until 1918 when someone finally legally proved the whale was not a fish but was a mammal. So we slaughtered the largest creatures that have ever walked the earth for 100 years before we even knew what they were. Now, of course, we've learned sperm whale meat has a laxative quality. Good for them. Pursued by 2,700 ships, 2,500 captains, and 175,000 men over the years of whaling, 30 to 40 percent of whom were people of color, men of color, most, perhaps as many as 90 percent, only went once. Over 60% of the time that whaling was a business enterprise, 280 some years, black people were enslaved and people of color were marginalized. So the kind of answer to the question, you know, how did these people become whaling captain is this was a business that was so bad no one wanted to do it. Now we don't know that because we all are supposed to have read Moby Dick. And what a wonderful story. You know, now we look at that literature and that may have been a metaphor for the Civil War. Now, we don't know if the bad guy was Captain Ahab or the white whale. My money's kind of on Captain Way Ahab. But when we talk about, you know, the business and how bad was it, the business model was to find a whale, kill it, cut it up, melt it down to oil, fill the hull, and return home. Turned out it was the second most dangerous occupation after mining. Some of the features of whaling, boredom, cannibalism, inadequate clothing, desertion, disease, poor food, odors from hell, bad and inexperienced management, barbaric medical care, mutiny, parsimonious owners, poor pay, piracy, cramped quarters, vermin infestation, frightening weather, and a few times whales that fought back. So 950 of these 2,500 captains at some point of their whaling career were replaced for some reason having to do with their inability to finish the trip. It, it might have been um, they were killed. It might have been they got sick. 
a myriad of things could happen. One I saw was, you know, you know, two knuckleheads for some reason playing around with gunpowder and blew up the first mate and the captain. But when you're 1,200 miles out to sea, no one cares who the captain is if he can get you home with the cargo. And that's how these people of color got their, occupa got their occupational promotion to captain, was replacing a captain that was, could not finish a trip. <clears throat> Now, some things get blown out of proportion willing. You know, first, you know, I've kind of killed the romance, I think, right? You know, just the boredom was bad enough, but cannibalism too, really? There were 71 mutinies. That doesn't sound like a lot, particularly when compared to 15,913 trips. But there weren't that many mutinies, so anytime there was one, it made worldwide news. Only 48 known captains were actually killed by whales. I say known captains because about 25% of all whale ships never returned to port, so we don't know what happened to them. Maybe it was mutinies, maybe it was whales, act of God, you know, we don't know. And then finally, only seven ships were ever attacked by a whale to begin with, flying in the, spa in the face, of course, the Pequod, all right, which is a fictional boat, but not so much for the Essex, which is the real deal when Nathaniel Philbrook wrote, you know, you know, the, you know, the, the, the warship Essex, the, the whale ship Essex. These are the times when Harper's Monthly, a whaler was known to, is quoted as saying, there's two kinds of whale. One is the sperm whale, the other is the rest of them. So over this period of time, we know from 1804 till 1931, we killed about 300,000 whales. That kind of doesn't sound like a lot when, you know, we need 300,000 people to be stuck in the arms so we won't all die of this crippling COVID disease. But in that period of time, in killing those whales, they produced about $10 billion. I'm glad to say, however, that um, that has all changed, and whale watching makes far more money today than whale killing ever did, and I mean by billions and billions and billions of dollars. Back to these captains, the first captain of color, as I called him, was a man named Paul Cuffey. He was born in 1759. He was captured by the British on a whale trip in 1776, and he was a captain of his own ship in 1792. Now, for a moment, think about those years, very matter-of-factly, those years and those numbers. Slavery was outlawed on Nantucket in 1775. Slavery was outlawed in the state of Massachusetts in 1783. When we think of slavery, we think in terms of 1865 or 100 some years later after all of this incurred. So this whaling had a whole lot to do with the end of slavery in America 100 years before it actually happened. Uh, I, I know I talk too fast, I'm, I'm, that's why I took notes to try to slow myself down because I have so much to tell you. Um, and a lot of it, you know, is facts and numbers, and here's a whole slew of some more. We know now there are 52 captains of color who had a consolidated career of 150 years, from Cuffey to a guy named Peter Gonzalez. They killed about 1,817 whales. They produced 164,000 barrels of oil on 271 discrete whaling voyages. And they produced about $75 million in 2016 dollars, which is a date I used when I was writing the book a few years back. Um, in talking about you know, these people and naming the book, you know, there were some hurdles. You know, the, the official title is Whaling Captains of Color, America's First Meritocracy. I'm extraordinarily gratified that my editor, who told me my, I wrote too many words to begin with, and the book was terribly out of order. Um, and in fact, I didn't know what else to do after getting, what I did was go out and find all the information I could about every single one of these people and I put over here. And then I had all the information, said, okay, this is gonna be a book, you know, what am I gonna do? So, you know, chronologically, why didn't I report on all of these men when they, they became a whaling captain? And that's what I did. And man, it was boring as hell. <laughs> it really was. And, and my editor was kind enough to say that. Some of the words she used could have been described in four letters. <clears throat> but she did give me an idea to, you know, you know, you need to create a narrative about these guys and what happened along the way and tell us a little bit more about whaling and the results of what you see today. Um, I'm kind of proud of that um, for a number of reasons. You know, one is, the most famous book that the Naval Institute Press ever published was a book called Hunt for Red October by Tom Clancy. 
who I did meet and actually took him shooting. He said he had never shot. I'm not going to tell you what kind of gun, but I took him out to shoot one of those, and he was delighted and had a ball. And I'm like, dude, you've never shot one of these. You own a tank. He literally owned a tank at his house in Virginia, in an old army tank. But, but back to that title, um, Edward says, no. Your job is to make sure that people don't put the book down. Ours is to make sure they pick it up. So we picked the cover and we picked the title. So I said, okay, that's cool. But how do you like Whaling Captains of Color, America's First Meritocracy? Not so bad. We'll work with that. Well, research went into that because at first it was about black whaling captains. Well, how do you describe someone as black who does not describe himself as black himself? Beginning with indigenous people like Native Americans and ended with the Cabo de Verdeans, the Cape Verdeans, who ended the whaling industry itself. So I spent a, you know, you don't know this about me. Um, I was really good in the media business. I was pretty good and very well known in the radio business. I am a professional researcher. That's something I'm really good at. Um, I, I've, um, <clears throat> I've conducted research that has changed the measurement of radio listening when it was called Arbitron and, you know, and now Nielsen and things like. So, you know, I, I, I had some skills, shall I say, you know, in, in this area. So I sat down with two of my buddies who were Kate Burns. I'm like, dude. What do you think? Black whaling cats. Well, you know, and they explained the nature of it. And, you know, it's pretty easy. You know, people who look like me, kid I grew up with, sidebar story. One Martha's Vineyard, you know, was Kate Burton. He's darker than me, even with my tan during the summer. And somehow the conversation got around to Ray says, oh, no, I'm not black, I'm white. I'm like, dude, you better go look in the mirror quickly, because that's not what we see. <laughs> But if you stop, you know, Cabo de Verde is now its own country since 1975. All right? They have different religions. They have their own dialect, Criollo. Their food is different. How they cook, how they eat, how they've grown up. You know, this was a nation imperiled by drought for several years. One time, 30,000 people died there because there was no water. Another time, it was 20,000 people. This was one of the first stops that our whalers went to when they crossed the ocean was to that little nation off West Africa called Cabo de Verde, you know, or the Cape, the Cape Verde Islands. They stopped there to get water, if it was there, or to get fresh fruit and fruit. And they also did to get more crew because this is really a terrible business. Where I live on Martha's Vineyard, there's the beautiful Egertown Harbor with the Egertown Lighthouse, which you may have heard of. Many, many years ago, the lighthouse was actually a house and there was a wooden walkway leading to that house, and they called that the Bridge of Size. And that was where the young, blonde, blue-eyed young man would walk out to make out with his girlfriend the night before his whaling trip, because he knew when he came back he was going to be rich and build the big white house with the, with the black shutters on the water, and they would get married and have children and live happily ever after. I think he got about four miles to sea by what we call green number three down in Mutton Shoals, and he was sick as a dog and wanted to get the hell off that ship. And we found over the years, what we learned is 40% of the people who went whaling deserted. This is a business of 175,000 people where over 90% of them did not take a second trip, and most of them wanted to get off the boat as quickly as they possibly could, which is in Cabo de Verde. Well, of course, the end of the story was you know, because life was, you know, was okay but not really great for Cape Verdeans, they were the ones who would buy the whaling ships at the end of the industry for a dime on a dollar and change them into what's called a packet ship that they would use to go over to Cabo de Verde and bring their people back and take them the goods that, that they lacked. So that's why I sat down with my buddies and said, you know, how do you guys, you know, like to be called? And they suggested persons of color. And all of a sudden that was brilliant because that also included the indigenous people. Sidebar about that. Around about 1740, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, to a large degree, Cape Cod, to some degree, the Shinnecock, you know, in Long Island, there was no such thing as a... Native American, indigenous person going back from when they were born because we were encouraged to intermarry with black people under the guise of, you know, well, if you have children, your children will never be slaves. Well, that wasn't true. Native Americans never were slaves after 1607. 
And it was also not true because now you are no longer a Native American and now you're not entitled to those tribal lands. We can keep those lands. But it happened anyway, and you know, it is what it is. So people of color made a lot more sense in trying to describe them by some narrow ethnic background, you know, that was probably insupportable. I wanted to also use this evening, as luck would have it, um, there's some new news about whaling that I want to spend a little bit of time and share with you this evening. Um, a new friend of mine named Barbara Coffey is the finance research librarian at Princeton University. In June this year, she published a piece called The 19th Century U.S. Whaling Industry, Where is the Risk Premium? New Materials Facilitate an Updated View. She did an analysis of whaling, just like I did, to cursor through all the information and find all those who are, we could clearly identify as persons of color, which, by the way, today you can't do. You can't ask someone when they, you offer them a job, are you black, are you Cape Verde, are you Native American? You, know, you can't ask any of those questions. But then with the Siemens Protection Papers, the customs officer or the ship's captain would write down the information and, all the, and check off the boxes of who you were, what color you were, what you looked like, where you were from, how old are you, how tall, you know, those type, you know, demographically honed information. And they characterized those things, which is how we know who was who. Dr. Coffey went and looked at 11,257 of the analyzable 15,913 whaling trips, come to find these voyages provided a mean return of 4.7%. What does that mean? That's about what U.S. government bonds do today. They return about 4.6%. Okay? Back then, U.S. bonds performed at a rate of about plus 4.6%. There was no risk. You put up $10, you get $10.46.7 back is what that means. Well, that was a pretty huge story. And she also pointed out the returns from the San Francisco Bay voyages were extraordinary, often exceeding 33 and a third percent. So, you know, now we see why people, you know, took on this, this ghastly opportunity as a ways of, you know, providing income from themselves. By the way, that 11,200 voyages, you know, for the sake of the statisticians, that was 70% of all whaling trips. To put that in another perspective, we have 3, 000, about 3,200 whaling logs left of these 15,000 trips, and from these stultifyingly boring whaling logs, we know something about whaling and what it was like. We know far more about the journals that ship's officers and ship crewmen kept over the years, because they would tell the, the toll story, not just the weather was this, here's where we got the whale, here was our location, okay, and everything is fine. They don't tell you, you know, about the whippings that the captain had to, had, to per, had to perform because a ship's captain, a whaling captain, was fundamentally omniscient. When you put your feet aboard a whaling ship, that guy's the boss. You do everything he says, what he has to say, and some of the penalties included being whipped by a cat of nine tails, which wasn't outlawed until 1850. So you did what you were told. That was a part of the story. So, I, I talked to Bobby and I said, you know, hey, listen, you know, if I sent you the data from my guys, could you give me an idea, you know, how they performed as well? She said, you know, let me take a look at it. Well, week before last, my Cape Cod, well, no, my captains of color generally um, performed at a rate of about 11.8%. That compares to the injuries 4.6%. Or as we say back when I was back in my old M&A days, that's 3x. These guys provided three times the performance of the entire whaling industry. No wonder they went out and found these black guys, the Native Americans, the Cabo de to do that besides the fact no one else wanted to. Here in Cape Cod, I broke that down a little bit further. William A. Martin, the guy who prompted me to you know, pursue the study and ultimately write this book, his was 11.7%, about the same of all the captains of color. A guy named John T. Gonzalez, who was the last captain, the last captain of the whale ship Charles W. Morgan, whose entire crew was persons of color. But over his career, many of his trips were from San Francisco, was 
So was a man named Collins A. Stevenson from Provincetown performed at 27.8%. That's seven times better than the industry that this man didn't. Now, the way Steven did it, his trips were short. Instead of being out there for three and a half to four years, he was out for three and a half to four months. He didn't go all the way around the world, have to go to one of those two capes, you know, where, and, and pursue the danger of that, you know, wind and water and waves. He just went down to Bermuda and around then, but 27% was outstanding. Better than that was a man named William A. Shorey, who started his career in Provincetown. His performance was 63.4%. Now, that's the guy you want to hire if your job's killing whales. So it's very interesting, you know, now more and more and more data is coming out about whaling as a business, as an enterprise, and we can relate to it today. Just go back to the whole notion of hedge funds and private equity funds, whose performance, by the way, is about 4.7, 4.8%. A little bit different is they're not taking their lives in their hands, all right? You know, you, you'll read the book... Um, Tom Nichols, Tom Nichols' book, uh, VC, stands, which stands for Venture Capital. And his first chapter of that book is about the whaling industry and relating it to modern times and modern money. It's actually, you know, pretty fascinating. Uh, more so, I think, than Leviathan, which is the first such book written like that by um, um, Davis Gleitman and Gallman, you know, you know whomever. Uh, but Leviathan took place from the years roughly 1840 till about 1860. That's not a 280-year period. That's a microcosm. You know, that's a blood test you know, of all of whaling. But both of them managed to say that 65% of whaling ventures were successful. Now, that's if you define success as getting home, because often you got home broke. And if you're one of the crewmen you know, down on the food chain someplace, you might owe them money when you're finished with your trip. By that. People are always horrified, you know, and I, I, I like to bring this fact up just to horrify you, candidly. This is a business where men clean their clothes with urine. How bad <laughs> did your clothes smell that that was a reasonable alternative, okay? That's how bad whaling was. That's what we're talking about. But after killing all those whales and you're all smelly and icky and dirty and covered with maggots and, you know, who else and everything else, you had to buy more clothes still on that three and a half or four year trip. You had to buy those clothes from the ship's captain. And, of course, they charged you as much as they possibly could because that was part of the returns of the whaling business. How much money can we make, you know, from, the, from these endeavors? So Leviathan, you know, that book kind of misses, you know, all of those romantic notions, you know, they miss the heart of the whaling, you know, and the people, it was, you know what, and this is, this is petty of me, and, and yeah, I wrote a book, I'm allowed to be petty at this point, don't you think? They don't mention the word African American in the index in their book. They mention Temple's toggle without mentioning Lewis Temple, the black man who invented the only, the only technological improvement in whaling, the harpoon that didn't come out when you pulled it or the whale tried to run away. Didn't even mention it. Another man, this is, this is more brand new news. In a book published this past April, 2020, by the way, I know of these people because, you know, Timothy Walker, I'm about to talk about, Barbara Coffey, called me and said, hey, look, let's do something together. I think they just want to come to Martha's Vineyard and do a show at our museum, which is fine. Um, I'd rather convince them to do something someplace larger, maybe a Nantucket museum, not my island, but another, or New Bedford, or, or whatever. Tim Walker, Dr., excuse me, Timothy D. Walker, is professor of history at UMass Dartmouth. His book, Sailing to Freedom, Maritime Dimensions of the Underground Railroad, was published in April. In his book, he says, between 1809 to 1865, of 3,000 men of color who were looked at in the Siemens Protection Certificates, okay, 17% of them were born in a slave state. That's about 500 people. If you multiply those numbers times all of whaling, you know, you know, 15% of them, now you're up to 5,050 people out of 175,000 who went whaling who may have been slaves formerly. Now, someone in one of these Zooms said, you know, well, well Skip, did any slaves, uh, any runaway slaves become whaling captains? I said, I don't know, but if they did, they'd do a very bad job of it. 
because people are not going to want to know that you're a runaway slave. That's something you would tend to want to keep to yourself. So expecting some quite a bit of news in this era, in this area, largely because just rationally, none of us were there, but if you think about it, if you're a slave in resume speed, Mississippi, or wherever it might be, how would you get away? You got a half hour head start before they let the dogs loose. They're probably gonna find you. But if you're on a river or if you're on the coastland, there's no dogs chasing you. Okay, we do know that Pardon Cook you know, was a whaler, one of these captains who helped slaves escape, to escape from slavery. We do know on the island of Nantucket that that community over there saved several escaped slaves from getting taken back in, you know, to slavery because they wanted these people to work on these ships. The people who fought most and hardest against slavery, besides the abolitions we know about, we forget the Quaker community, the Friends, the ones who run from Britain themselves, pursued and hassled by the pilgrims even here and the Puritans, they understood that people should be entitled to live their life as it was. Doesn't mean that they were into, you know, come over to my house for dinner, we're not saying that, we're not talking full integration, but they didn't think people should be enslaved, and it made more sense for them to work on these, on these ships. They had several good reasons for that, of course. One was, when they founded Nantucket and the Europeans came, they brought their diseases with them and the indigenous population died off. The ones who had taught them how to whale in the first place. So the black people and the Cape Cabo de Verdeans replace the early people who knew, about, who, who knew about whaling to begin with. Duncan Oliver, in fact, it was, it was really cool. I got into an argument with some folks down in Southampton. Duncan Oliver, you don't know, wrote the book, you know, Cape Cod Shore Whaling, um, which I reference in my book, as a matter of fact. Um, that was a little skinny room history press. He's given me a signed copy of the larger one, you know, this evening. Um, <clears throat> but that was how whaling started. And down in Southampton, when I gave my speech, the, the folks in Long Island were saying, well, oh, you know, we were the first. We're, our Native Americans were the first whalers. You know, and Cape Cod says the same thing, and Nantucket says the same thing. Mods Vineyard says the same thing, and I get to brag because there was an old deity named Moship who talked about whales and whaling before there was the internet or TV or radio or books or writing or printers. So I delight in that. I might not be right, but I've got the microphone right now, and Duncan's sitting out there. I want to leave some time for some questions. I'm going to try to dance out of here and scurry back and get back to my island. Um, but I thought, in honor of the Charles W. Morgan, and leaning on my own Irish heritage, if you, if you mind, there are good ships and wood ships, the ships that sail the sea. But the best ships are friendships, and may we always be. Thank you very much. It, would, does anyone have a question besides Duncan? Yes. Well, well, let me tell you a little bit about whales. What we know now, we know whales have their own language. We're pretty sure whales have their own religion. We know they're sentient beings. We know they know how to band together, all right, with all of their tails in and spout and spouts out when they're attacked by a group of orcas. They knew we were trying to kill them and they kept going further and further and further and further away, okay? On Nantucket, which burgeoned the entire whaling industry, they had two problems. One was a fairly evident problem. They have a very shallow harbor. So they couldn't get the boats that were large enough to go chase these whales across around the whole world, okay, because the boats weren't big enough. So they made a pontoon device to raise the boats, but that didn't work. And of course, the biggest reason is Nantucket didn't have any trees. They couldn't build ships. So the business moved to New Bedford, which was right on the ocean, probably one of the best harbors in the entire world to do that. But the whales weren't stupid. You know, whales, whales breathe, I believe, six or eight times a minute compared to hummingbird, which is about 80 times a minute. That's why they live so long. 
Philip Hoare, in his book, The Whale, talked about uh, a doctor who carbon dated a harpoon they found in a whale, come to find that it was 235 years old, not the whale, the harpoon. So theoretically, whales may have outlived America that are still swimming around today. And yet we tried to kill them all. But when there was no more demand for whale oil, excuse me, after 1857, when whale oil, shale oil was discovered in Pennsylvania, and you know, then later on in the you know, latter 1800s, when France finally decided that Catherine de' Medici was wrong and women should not have a 15-inch waist, we don't need those corsets that the baleen, that were made from the baleen, you know, from whales. So it was the whales smartly running from us, not us going farther together, and we just had to do that. Along the way, by the way, the American whaler mapped the world. All of our oceans, all of our islands, all of our atolls, everything we know about it, were discovered by our American whalemen. We were the best at killing stuff. That, that's, how it all, that's how it all shakes out. One thing, Benjamin Franklin, when he was with the King of England one time, was asked, how come your American guys can get to America from Britain and back quicker than we can? So he said, well, I don't know. So he asked his cousin, Mr. Captain Folger, and Folger said, oh, well, we've got the Gulf Stream. So if it's going that way, all right, you know, at the beginning of the summer, we know to aim our boats this way so the current will help carry us to where we're going and just to reverse when we get back. That's what we know today, all those 3,200 whaling logs are being used to go back in history and determine what the weather was then to predict what it's going to be now. So it wasn't the whales, it was us. The whales were smart enough to get out of the way of those harpoons. Anyone? What's your next book? Uh, uh, I never intended to write this one. And I wrote another one called The Historic Tales of Oak Bluffs while I was waiting for this one to come out. Um, but in all candor, I'm now working on a documentary, a uh, six-part series based generally on the book um, with a partner of the Mystic, Mystic um, Seaport Museum is going to be my partner in doing this. And they're actually going to let me use the Charles W. Morgan to film on you know, for the documentary, presuming I raise the money or sell it to somebody like Netflix or Apple, you know, who can, um, you know, retire me, and then I'll think about another book. Might be sure whaling. <laughs> Volume two. No, I'm kidding. Yes. Uh, yes, Kim. What was life like after the captain's had finished all their voyages and had to come back home with somewhat of a Great question. Not a happy ending. I'm only aware of two homes that are owned that were owned by black whaling captains. One is running down on the island of Chappaquiddick off the island of Martha's Vineyard. The other one is Captain Shorey's house, which is a very small, modest place, which is on the National Register in Oakland, California. Um, for these people, including Paul Cuffey, who was probably America's first millionaire, you know, in the terms that, you know, that we would use today, um, that money dissipated. You know, whaling is, is, whaling is not a transferable skill. You know, it, it took, you probably weren't that smart if you did it. That's me, easy for me to say. But you had to be brave as hell. And that's about it. You had to learn something about navigation. You had to know a little bit about the sea and sailing and things. Um, but it wasn't something you could leave behind to your children. So all that money that came back pretty much lasted to, for the subsistence of the family that was left behind. I wish I had a better story to tell you, but you know, you know, such is life back then, but I, I can only assume these men's lives were certainly better than the folks living in resumed speed Mississippi. Yes. I did not look that number up. I could. It would take some work. You could probably calculate it from my book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a wild guess and probably 200, 300 in that, in that range. Not as many as you would presume, just because New Bedford was huge. New Bedford was fundamentally monolithic. They called it the city of light, or oil city, because that New Bedford, in 18, 1853, I believe, the New York Times said was the richest town in the, in the world. And per capita, it was. We don't know about totally. I mean, because you know, there's Greece and Paris and London, some other cities we've heard about. Yes. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. This business is no one to be. You know, in fact, I'm fairly certain that both John Gonzalez and William Shorey completed more trips as captains of whale ship than anyone else. I'd have to research that, you know, you know but I'm, I, I've read enough at this point, I'm fairly certain that that is true. They didn't have as many opportunities as everybody else. You know, when, you know, when, <clears throat> and, and you know, these are the days when, you know, you could be a millionaire or the equivalent of a millionaire, but you couldn't buy a house. You couldn't get a loan from a bank. You couldn't get a mortgage. You couldn't get a job in most places. If you think about it, those, those such was the nature of our history and our times back then. Fortunately, all that's changed. I don't know anybody who chooses to be a whale and captain. It wouldn't be me. Yes, I always get that, oh, I have a whole list of information. I, I won't believe you with it. Uh, Captain Valentine Rosa, kind of a great story, funny story. He was aboard a, a whale ship, and his captain had his wife aboard the ship, and she was a navigator. And he did such a good job, and they liked him so much, she taught him how to navigate. And that's how he became a captain. Fast forward many years later on the Canton too, when he was on one of his ships, his wife was there, and she was a navigator. Now, the ship did sink. No one was killed. I'm not trying to cast any aspersions. I'm just saying history is what it is. <laughs> I don't know if she was navigating or not, but we know the Canton too went down. <laughs> but there's more stories, and there's more, and there's more books. Um, a, a very interesting one by a um, lady named Martha Hodis, which I read recently. Um, I'd, I'd have to get my, refer to my notes and get the name, but you know, you know, after many, many years, this white woman married a black whaling captain, and this talks about the story of their life, some of which was happy, most of which was not. Okay, um, in a parable, the captain of the whale ship Essex, that was his first trip. Okay, um, Captain Shorey in San Francisco, I think was on about 28 trips. So there's you know, some balance. You know, a little bit more about the Essex, for example. I, in case all of you haven't heard the story, the Welsh had a real trip, real ship, left Nantucket, went to sea, 19, 18, 20, 18, 19, 18, 20, you know, around then. Um, 30 guys aboard the ship. Seven of them happened to be black. Four of them were cannibalized. Two of them lost at sea with everybody else because, you know, the, the whale crushed the ship. They were just in four lifeboats, four whale ships, you know, trying to get home thousand miles away from land. Um, one guy named Henry DeWitt ran away. <laughs> and, and, you know, he left. He was, he was a black guy. I don't know. I think he was the smartest guy on the ship. He's the only one that got off. The other guys who lived took two years to get home, and only eight of them made it back, by the way. So I kind of credit that doing the job, doing the job, doing the job, doing the job, doing the job. You know, now, now think about it. You know, your whaling trip last three to four years. The longest trip was 11 years and 10 months. Imagine that. Imagine three and a half to four years, and, you know, you're on the ship with these 30 other guys, which is, you know, did they get along? Of course they got along, because if you didn't get along with the white guy, then the captain's going to whip you. <laughs> it's real easy. It's real easy. Your job, find the whale, kill it, cut it up, render it to oil, bring it home. That was the name of the game. So in terms of returns, if I was a betting man, I bet on the person who's been on a dozen whale trips. Because right, a dozen whale trips might mean 36 years worth of experience. Now, even if you only learn one thing 36 times, you've got to be good at it. Anyone? Wow, this is an easy crowd. No one asked me any tough questions. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.